And now, yeah, it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Betty van Arken. I know Betty actually for several years, I know. And um, I don't know much about her current research topic in the medical NLP or clinical NLP domain. So very much looking forward um, to this talk. I guess it's very applied. Um, let's see. Um, welcome to the stage, Betty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks for the invitation. Um, I'm very pleased to speak here. Um, yeah, I will uh, talk about uh, how we plan with our work on supporting healthcare professionals with clinical NLP. And first, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a PhD student, as uh, Julian said, um, at the, the Texas Research Group. We are um, at the Berlin University of Applied Science and Technologies, or simply BHT. Uh, which was formerly the Boyd University, if uh, some of you remember. Um, and my work uh, kind of circles around um, representation learning in general, um, with a focus on transfer learning and um, explainability. And uh, via the transfer learning, I also get to work with um, DeepSet's farm framework a lot, which was uh, really interesting. And yeah, so my current domain is clinical NLP, and this is also what I'm going to talk about today. Um, so my talk agenda for today, um, I first want to um, tell you something about uh, what we're actually doing, which is clinical outcome prediction, um, and then uh, how we uh, want to improve outcome pre-training, um, or outcome prediction with outcome pre-training from unlabeled data. Um, and as a third part, um, I want to give a small sneak peek into um, our most current work about prototypical networks for interpretable outcome prediction. Um, but as I said, this is going to be uh, really quick because it's just a work in progress, but um, stuff I'm really excited about. So I'm really happy about feedback as well. Um, so let's start. Uh, what is clinical outcome prediction? Um, actually, uh, we are at that Texas working together with uh, doctors from Charité Berlin, and um, we kind of uh, met uh, in uh, like two or three years ago and from that on started to um, talk a lot about use cases for clinical NLP um, and we figured out like one starting point um, which is a new patient getting admitted to the hospital um, because this patient is usually documented in a clinical note uh, which is of somehow semi-structured form so you can see for example these um, sections here um, and based on uh, this notes and all other information that come in, medical professionals start to uh, make predictions about the patient's trajectory and also make first decisions. The problem here is that the time for these decisions is uh, usually pretty short and um, doctors might miss certain risks, um, especially if, it, if they are new doctors or uh, they're in a stressful situation. Um, so our goal is to support doctors in these scenarios um, by just uh, extending the medical options they might consider and um, to point towards um, possibly overseen risks. Um, so what we first did was uh, we created um, tasks that we called admission to discharge tasks. So the input for that is an admission note. Um, and as output task, we identified four prediction tasks, uh, which are diagnosis, procedures, in-hospital mortality, and length of stay prediction. Um, so we have a patient on the one side at the admission, and what we want to predict is the discharge state of the patient. And um, using this, um, we want to build models that are actually finding uh, relevant risk factors in the admission node, um, and use them to make the right uh, predictions about the uh, patient discharge state. All right, so which data did we use? Uh, I think most of you know that uh, clinical data um, is uh, kind of sparse. Um, so we started uh, with the publicly available MIMIC3 database, uh, which I guess some of you are familiar with. Um, and this is a data set cont um, that contains discharge summaries. Um, of 50,000 ICU admissions. Uh, so um, quite a lot uh, for, for clinical data, at, at least. 
Mm, and they are annotated with um, mortality, length of stay, um, more than 1,000 different diagnoses, and uh, 700 procedures. So the only problem was that we only got the discharge summaries, and most of the uh, clinics um, also only store discharge summaries. Uh, so we sat together with the doctors again and um, kind of identified that um, there are sections in each discharge summary, or at least in almost all of them that are already known at admission time. So what we did was we took the discharge summaries and actually simulated the admission state by just cutting off all of the sections that are not known at the admission time. Um, and so uh, we actually got to our task set up by having the simulated uh, admission node uh, from which we can pred uh, predict the uh, state of the patient at discharge. Okay, so um, next step um, was to actually find a way of making these predictions. And uh, our goal here was to find representations that work well on all four um, outcome prediction tasks. Um, and so, um, yeah, kind of naturally nowadays, we started um, to look at pre-trained me medical language models um, because um, they are obviously state of the art in um, the most of uh, clinical and medical NLP tasks. Mm, and at that time, uh, when we did this research, BioBird was actually a state of the art medical language model. So we um, based our work on BioBird and then kind of followed the idea of Guru Rangang at all that you should never stop pre-training and that multi-phase adaptive pre-training um, actually offers a large uh, task, task performance gains. Um, and we thought, well, our medical language models, um, they kind of have learned to process medical text in general, but they have not learned about patient outcomes. So how can we get this information about patient outcomes into our models? And um, what we did was, um, looking back at um, all the kind of split data that we have from our admission notes. And we uh, saw that we actually have a lot of information about patient trajectories within these notes. So what we did, we simply took um, our, uh, our discharge summaries in the two halves that we get them, the admission and the discharge half. And we showed our model part of the admission and part of the discharge, and then ask the model how likely it is that this discharge is actually belonging to the admission at hand. Um, so uh, some of you might recognize this because it's pretty similar to the next sentence prediction task from the original BERT pre-training. And this is also something that we leverage because the models were already able to fulfill this kind of task to kind of uh, be asked whether this is a continuation, so, so to say, um, of, uh, of the first uh, part. And yeah, so from this, we actually, um, yeah, we added um, half um, of the samples were uh, random negative samples, and we created this into this self-supervised learning task, uh, which is closely to, related to the next sentence prediction task. Um, and how this looks like uh, in the end was that we had a bird model, um, which uh, is the base of BioBird, and then we took BioBird as the base of um, our pre-training model, which is which we called clinical outcome representations or core in short. Um, and then we kind of leave the pre-training stage and uh, trained all of the four outcome tasks in a supervised manner. Um, and looking at this um, uh, pre-training again, um, what, which data we took was uh, first the training data from our MIMIC-3 data set. Um, so we kind of reused uh, all the data that we um, also use in our supervised task, uh, but this time in our clinical outcome pre-training um, objective. Uh, we also used data from empty samples uh, that got 5,000 uh, openly available clinical notes and from I2B2. And for all these samples, we were able to identify which sections uh, are most likely um, part of the admission note and which uh, sections were likely part of the discharge 
information that we uh, need. Um, and because this is only the pre-training stage, the matching could be a bit more fuzzy at this point um, than later in our um, downstream tasks. Mm, but um, yeah, you can see uh, actually here how one of the training examples would look like. So we have the typical uh, BERT uh, class token, uh, then we get the admission information, uh, separator, and then the discharge information. And the label for um, this example, uh, because it comes from one patient, would be simply the, a true label. Um, and so this actually gave us uh, the possibility to um, train on a lot of patient trajectories, even if the samples were basically unlabeled. And then we extended this to um, also using um, other clinical articles. Um, like from uh, PubMed or uh, from the Wikipedia and uh, MedQuad, uh, which contains of, uh, a lot of um, medical articles and descriptions. Uh, and there, instead of having an admission part and the discharge part, uh, we split the notes uh, or the, the text into, um, for example, symptoms and risk factors for Wikipedia um, or into treatments and the prognosis. So uh, we always got like this patient trajectory that we are looking at. Um, and then we could create the same task as we did for the patients. Well, and um, with this, we could actually uh, fulfill our objective. Um, we compared against a uh, simple uh, back of words baseline, CNN, BERT, and especially BioBERT. Um, and on all of our four outcome prediction tasks, uh, we could improve the scores, um, which was the goal of our work. And um, as you can see, the improvement is not uh, like by a very uh, large uh, margin, um, but this might also have to do with the fact that we only used um, publicly available data here. And the idea is that um, if clinics want to uh, use the same procedure, um, most of the time they're actually um, able to, uh, they actually have a very large uh, data, um, uh, data storage or like databases, but they are all unlabeled. So I would actually um, uh, expect to um, see a larger improvement if the size of um, unlabeled data increases. Okay, so if you are interested um, in this outcome pre-training and all that we did with it, um, I can um, just point you to our uh, website here, which is core.app.atext.com. Um, and there you can also find hugging face checkpoints, um, especially for the core model, but also uh, for, the, um, uh, for the downstream tasks. So uh, for mortality prediction and diagnosis prediction. Um, then we have our outcome demo there, which I can also uh, quickly show, um, where you can actually just uh, input a clinical note and then um, let the core model um, predict the output. Um, here on the left side, we see the predictions. On the right hand side, we see um, the ground truth. And here we can actually see that um, uh, the mortality prediction was uh, predicted correctly, length of stay as well. And for the diagnosis and procedures, all of the green examples are correct and uh, all of the uh, black ones not. Um, so you will see in uh, a lot of cases um, some inconsistencies in the labels, of course, um, because some, um, some diagnoses are not really consistently labeled. Um, and also uh, you can see that there's still like a large uncertainty because um, obviously um, patients are not all the same, even if uh, like all patients in the training set developed a certain disease, uh, we cannot be sure about um, the next patient, but um, at least we can give some recommendations to where to look at. And if, if you want to test on your own data, this is just uh, sample data from, um, uh, which is not originally for MIMIC3 because um, you actually have to apply 
um, to be able to access this data set. But you can simply add your own example and uh, check out um, what, uh, what predictions the model uh, makes. Um, so yeah, feel free to uh, play around with this. Um, and yeah, as I said, I think I have like uh, 10 minutes left. Uh, I uh, want to give a short um, sneak peek into our uh, most current work, uh, which are prototypical networks uh, for interpretable outcome prediction. Um, so what is the motivation uh, for this work? Um, it's actually that doctors need a bit more than just uh, what we can offer here with these simple predictions, um, because they actually also need indicators of these predictions in the text to be able to uh, understand whether these predictions make sense, whether they are uh, based on uh, some false assumptions, or um, just to get an overview of the patient and uh, to get quick looks of uh, a, quick, a quick overview of um, whatever is important at the moment. And another thing that uh, most of the doctors told us is that uh, they actually want to be able to find similar patients from early encounters that are kind of related to the patient at hand. Um, and these two requirements um, led us to think and um, what we uh, actually uh, came out with was um, approach uh, using prototypical networks. Um, and I'm not quite sure if some of you are familiar with uh, the idea of prototypical networks, but uh, for us, uh, it was actually um, somehow uh, motiv um, motivated from image classification. Um, this is a very small example from uh, a very interesting work, uh, 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 like a uh, work that's called This Looks Like That. And here it's actually about classifying birds. Um, and they classify birds based on prototypes. So first uh, for a sparrow, for example, you learn how a prototypical sparrow looks like. And then in an image that you um, classify or that you want to classify, um, you're looking for parts that do look like your prototypical sparrow. So um, you could check the head, the feathers, uh, the feet, uh, whatever. And um, the network can actually inherently learn like that some parts uh, look like others and uh, you can also access this uh, form in a, a ex like as an explanation. And um, this is something that uh, I found very interesting and that kind of motivated me to try this out for text and especially for this clinical scenario because we, we always have um, clinical notes where some parts might remind the doctor of another patient. And this is actually exactly what we want to learn into our models. So um, we found out that it's actually possible to transfer this to the text domain first, and um, that it could be very helpful in, uh, in the clinical NLP scenario. Um, so we could still have our admission note here on this side and encode it with BERT or with CORE, as I just described. Um, but then instead of um, just um, putting the bird multi-label hat on top of it, um, we look at its position in the vector space and compare it to previously learned prototype type vectors for a certain diagnosis. So in this case, we could see that um, uh, the admission node is pretty close to a prototype vector of cerebral uh, hemorrhage or the bone bruise. Uh, but it's not close enough to the spinal cord injury um, prototype vector to make this prediction. Um, and for me, it was important that the model is uh, really not, uh, not over complicated, but uh, pretty simple. So um, I'm really basing um, the final predictions only on the distances between uh, the prototype vectors and this uh, BERT uh, or core encoded admission node. Um, so that we can easily say, um, well, this is, this is a large distance in the vector space, so the model might not be that certain, or um, that we can also use this model to, for example, um, add new prototypes uh, when we see a need for it. So
So um, if we um, uh, have, for example, a new disease um, developing, uh, we don't have to train our model from scratch. We can simply add a new prototype and um, um, uh, based on uh, some information, maybe from um, uh, uh, new patients that come in. Um, and this can allow us to just extend our model as we like. Um, so this is, this is really interesting to me and uh, it becomes even more interesting if I think about um, uh, that these uh, prototype vectors can also give us a hint about uh, what like a typical similar patient would look like. Um, it might be that this admission node is from a patient that is um, uh, atypical, uh, but these vectors that are learned from our training data, they actually represent like a, a very typical approach. And this could also point us to, uh, to certain symptoms that uh, the doctors might not always consider um, that are prototypical for a certain disease. Um, based on this, um, our next step is um, still like, how can we highlight uh, the parts in the admission notes that are important? Um, and there uh, we are currently working on an attention-based uh, scenario that kind of creates different representation from one patient. So that for a certain disease, some tokens might be more interesting and more relevant than others. So we can simply create a new representation um, based on these tokens in the vector space. And uh, from this point on, see if they are close or far from a certain prototype. Um, so this actually gives us uh, first uh, the requirement that we are looking for, that the doctors can quickly see which part of a, a text uh, is important. Um, and uh, we can also uh, build uh, more specific patient representations because uh, a patient can actually have different representation based on what we are looking at at the moment and with what perspective uh, a doctor might look at the patient. So yeah, this is um, the current state uh, of uh, our work on prototypical networks. Um, we actually uh, plan to um, release the work uh, towards summer. Um, we also have a um, small uh, demo planned, uh, which I can just uh, quickly tease um, and which is still in development. Um, so it uh, might also just uh, take forever to make the prediction. Um, but um, the idea is that uh, we can actually, okay, I'm gonna skip this. We, you can uh, uh, ask me later if you're interested, we can uh, look at it in the breakout room. Um, but yeah, so if, if you might be working on prototypical networks, uh, which is a topic I'm really interested in about, at the moment, um, or if you are working on clinical NLP, um, I'm very happy to have a chat. Um, and yeah, that's it for me. Um, I'm also uh, happy to connect and um, also towards the end of the year, um, I'm going to uh, hopefully finish my PhD. And uh, so if you have any interesting positions you want to talk about, I'm also uh, happy to discuss this. And yeah, now I'm looking forward to questions. Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Very, very cool to see uh, NLP research so close to an application. So let's see if there are some questions, maybe via the chat or, or raised hands. Um, um, I definitely have some uh, questions or uh, ideas, let's say. Um, um, let's, let's see if there are any questions from the audience. If you have a question, yeah, write it in the chat, or you can also like raise your hand and then unmute yourself. So I was wondering about um, how much overlap there is of your research and uh, like human computer interaction, because it sounded like you're really building these applications or the demos with um, the, the doctors in mind or the, the medical personnel in mind, how they might interact with this, whether um, this influenced how you build the demos maybe, and also, uh, maybe you can explain what's important for the doctors um, regarding patients they had in the past, like this, this, um, this desire they have to uh, compare patients they have now with patients they had in the past. 
Yeah. Um, so I think about the um, connection between um, uh, uh, human computer computer interaction, I think it's a very interesting field, this connection. Um, and I think in the end, this kind of makes a difference also if a tool is going to be used at all or not. Um, I think uh, we in our team right now are, are more on the um, technical model building side still. Uh, so we kind of have to imagine how uh, things are going to be used later on, uh, but still want our models to deliver at least the requirements that like another tool might have later uh, that the doctors uh, directly use. So um, I think this is uh, something when it comes really to deploying a tool uh, directly used by doctors, which uh, becomes very interesting then. Um, but yeah, regarding the similar patients, um, we uh, actually, this was uh, one of the first requirements that we heard uh, from the very beginning because uh, the doctors are aware that there are these very large databases of patients in, uh, in the clinics, but still, if you want to uh, be reminded of how a certain case turned out, it's most of the time still using the telephone and calling your colleagues if they remember like, uh, this one patient they had and so on. So for us, it became very quickly clear that uh, you really have to make this connection and see the real cases uh, also, because um, uh, it's, uh, it's one thing to have like an idea about uh, how a patient might develop and might look, but uh, having the whole history and seeing like which decisions were made on this patient, I think this is really important. Yeah, also sounded to me like they, they have in mind asking another doctor, have you ever seen a patient with this and that symptoms? Have you ever seen that, experienced that? Yeah. So there are some questions in the chat uh, about prototypes um, because yeah, it's probably a new topic for, for many of us. And one question is about whether it's something like clustering or maybe like a zero shot classification in some sense and how you actually build the prototypes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also just uh, checking the questions. Um, so, uh, uh, one is it relating to cluster related to clustering or not? Um, so it is definitely related to clustering and we are talking about clustering a lot, um, because in the end you want to create, uh, meaningful clusters in the vector space, uh, around these prototypes. Um, and also we, uh, currently are at the point where we, um, want to find out at which point it makes sense to open up like a new prototype. And um, this is also, of course, something that we might find out by clustering and, and by uh, checking uh, the characteristics of the clusters and uh, whether they kind of demand a new prototype to be created for the disease, because some diseases are uh, obviously very, um, very diverse in the way they uh, they uh, appear in patients so it might make sense to not only have one prototype uh, per diagnosis but also multiples um, and about the questions how we build the prototypes um, they are actually learned um, by the network end to end um, and they're initialized um, by um, just taking the average of all the patients with a certain diagnosis. So we have like a starting point there. And from this point on, they can be learned into like the, the most, um, uh, the, like the best uh, direction in vector space that represents like the most patients. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. And then uh, the, the question about languages um, is, uh, so the core model that I presented is currently only um, available in English. Um, and of course, with Charité, we are also doing uh, research on German uh, clinical notes, um, but um, there uh, it's uh, actually yeah, harder to share data and uh, so on. But actually, um, some of my colleagues are currently uh, working uh, on like German medical text and um, there might also um, like um, uh, might also uh, come out to some possibilities to uh, to share models in this direction. 
can machine translation work in that context, like translating these um, these kinds of data? I mean, definitely um, a challenge, yeah. I guess. <laughs> Uh, so we, we have uh, done some work on uh, multilingual uh, clinical NLP actually, and uh, we tested out how uh, trans how well translations work. And um, it definitely depends on the language. Um, so if the translations are in general well, so we had the Spanish and the Greek uh, example, and so for Greek it was kind of problematic, but uh, for Spanish uh, most of the parts uh, worked well. Um, the the question is always like how much medical vocabulary did you have in your pre-training um, also for the translations but it could be an option for sure like uh, for as a start mm -hmm. um, I saw in the chat one more question about the prototypical uh, prototypical networks and it's about independence assumptions so whether there is this assumption or not for the different symptoms so does the model take into account that maybe a symptom A and a symptom B are unlikely to co-occur together or like um, maybe also diagnosis that they are unlikely to co-occur together or are they made completely independently? Mm -hmm. um, so I would say uh, through the contextual encoding, um, these symptoms are uh, definitely uh, like uh, not independent, uh, but um, considered in context. So um, a symptom that occurs in a clinical note with another symptom has a different representation uh, than uh, a symptom co-occurring with uh, symptom C, so to say. Um, so um, I would uh, say these are patterns that the models are able to learn. Um, and um, it is actually possible to represent a patient um, based on a combination of symptoms, but also um, like uh, close to one diagnosis, but also based on a combination of symptoms not close to this. So for example, if you uh, get symptom A, but this never occurs with symptom, uh, uh, symptom B for a diagnosis uh, C, then um, this can actually be covered by the model. Ah, okay, yeah. And somebody's asking for a link maybe to the sneak peek demo. I don't know whether you can share this already or whether you want it already, but maybe we can also um, no, put it on maybe, the meetup site. Yeah. yeah, or maybe in the breakout rooms later, uh, mm -hmm. we can also have a, a short look at it. Uh, I yeah. think this could work. Yeah, and maybe then for the other public demo, um, like core.app.texas, um, yeah. I can put exactly. that online yeah, on the meetup page mm -hmm. maybe, and then others can look it up there. Okay. Ooh. All right, if there are no more questions for the moment, then we can uh, like save the other questions for the breakout rooms. And then um, maybe uh, if you have a question for now, um, you can still ask um, Betty in the chat and maybe Betty can, can also respond to the questions via the chat then. And I will now um, yeah, introduce the second speaker for today, who is Michel Bartels. Michel is an intern at DeepSet currently, so we're working together and he's working in NLP engineering. And one of his topics that he worked on was um, yeah, knowledge distillation or model distillation. And we will talk about it in more detail uh, in a second. I think what's very cool about it is that, um, yeah, it can shrink model size. And so uh, models need less memory and still achieves the same like performance in the quality of predictions. So it does not sacrifice any uh, prediction quality. Um, yeah, title is Accelerating Language Model Inference by 100%. That's quite a statement. Um, so Michael, the stage is yours. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk a bit about how we achieved this um, inference speed up and also what methods we used for this and how you could use or how, or how you can use the mod models we created using the method. Um, so the first, um, the first issue, uh, or the, the issue that model compression tackles, is I think something that ca can become quite clear when you look at this graph. That you can see that the um, the model size, meaning the numbers, the, the number of parameters in a language model, which you can see on the 
on the vertical axis um, grows over the years, which you can see on the horizontal axis. So this is an, an exponential growth, growth uh, model size roughly increasing by a factor of 10 each year. And this obviously creates some issues because, um, because uh, hardware doesn't um, doesn't uh, improve at the same rate. This means that inevitably when you use these big models, speed will go down, memory, memory usage will go up. Uh, the, in general, the hardware requirements increase and uh, energy consumption skyrockets as well. So um, what we decided to focus on was on this uh, smaller range at the bottom. In this range are models such as BERT, Roberta, Electra, and and so on, because um, mod models in this range are the ones we mostly and probably also you mostly use. Um, yeah, BERT is um, still a standard model for a lot of tasks. Um, so there are already a few models available. Um, well, like I said, Roberta base and BERT base and one very naive approach is just uh, to half uh, the numbers of parameters. So instead of having uh, 12 layers in Roberta and Bert base, you can have six layers. And this of course doubles the speed or uh, yeah, just doubles the, the latency. But as you can see, accuracy also goes down. Here you can see um, the performance on the SCORE 2 data set, which is basically the standard uh, extractive QA data set and is also representative uh, in a sense for a lot of other tasks. And obviously just decreasing size isn't an, isn't an option. However, using model compression, as you can see here, we were actually able to have half the size while still retaining a lot of performance. So performance is very similar with a, a two times speed up. So in general, the idea of model compression is that you have the la large model with a lot of parameters and a high quality. This high quality needs to be high enough for your use case because it basically serves as an upper bound. And you turn this large model into a smaller model with fewer parameters and the, and and a good method should be able to um, still uh, result in a comparable prediction quality using this smaller model. Um, there are two, there are two um, uh, popular approaches out there. One of them is pruning. Pruning is a very straightforward approach. You just identify parts of the network that aren't used, for example, they, are, they output zeros or they always output the same value and then you delete them from the network. This can be just one weight or larger, larger parts of the network. And the issue with that is that when you remove a lot of the new network, of course, accuracy will go down. If you just remove very little, accuracy uh, doesn't go down, but you create what's called sparse matrices, matrices with uh, basically elements left out and this doesn't really scale well on GPUs. So you don't actually have a performance improvement on GPUs. So even if it works well, you don't get a, you, you don't get a speed up. That's why we used uh, and the other approach that is out there called distillation. There you have uh, quite separate models. Uh, the large one that you've already trained and the smaller one. The large one is called the student. The smaller, uh, uh, the large one is called the teacher. The smaller one is called the student. The teacher is this big model that all already performs well. And you try to make the student behave as similarly as possible to the teacher. This has quite a few advantages because you can, you can uh, specify, you can specify the student architecture, meaning you uh, yeah, there's no constraints on architecture, which means you don't run into the, the, the same uh, the, the same ex, um, GPU acceleration issues, for example, which means they can actually give you this performance boost. And how, however, the disadvantage is that this is resource intensive because this you have this uh, stage where you where the teacher is teaches the student model and this is basically retraining of the student model and this of course adds additional training time but in, uh, in our experiments it paid off because inference time 
um, went down. Yeah. In our case, um, we used uh, an approach from Jiao at uh, uh, from 2020, which which they published in their paper called Tiny Bird. Um, this is a bit more complex than what you usually do in distillation, but it's quite useful because we got quite good results. Um, they have, you can mainly um, divide it into two stages. One is uh, the general distillation stage. This is similar to, for example, pre-training for large language models. However, however you have the, both uh, a pre-trained teacher and the student. And, and the advantage of this is similar to um, pre-training for language model for for language models usually, because you can reuse the results of this step for multiple tasks. So you um, basically do pre-training again. However, now you have the behavior of the large teacher model as a constraint for how the student model should behave. Um, then you have task-specific distillation which uses the same technique. However, you, that you, you use the task data set and um, the uh, an issue you run into there is that you need a lot of data for distillation. However, an advantage of distillation is because you have uh, basically the teacher behavior as a goal that data set quality doesn't actually matter so much. So you can use data augmentation, which means you um, take one sample out of the task data set and just change a few things in there. And then you, this way you can create a lot of samples out of one, out of one uh, sample. Um, this is then used to, this can then be used to um, do this distillation task specific distillation step to create uh, to turn this uh, very general student that you created in the general distillation step into a student that works uh, that works quite well on specific tasks uh, specific task um yeah those are the results which i already mentioned or which are or which i already showed um yeah the performance is quite similar and as you can see, it pays off to inv invest this additional training time. And now I can show you how you can use it in Haystack. <coughs> Sorry. Um, yeah. First of all, you need to um, do this data augmentation, which I described. Then um, for this, we've created a, a script with which you can just download from, from GitHub and then you can give as input a data set and it will output this data set. And after that, you can yeah, just load your model into Haystack in a few lines of code and then uh, call some uh, call um, two methods, which, uh, which, does all, uh, you, uh, which does all you need for uh, distillation for you in Haystack. Mm. As you can see, there are some hyperparameters which you can set, which you can tune. And um, one of them is mul the multiplication factor. This just controls how much you want to increase the data set size, like I mentioned. Um, in this step called data augmentation, you take one sample and make a, a lot of samples out of it by changing a few bits in the sample. And this multiplication factor just controls how many samples are made out of one. So if you have a data set with uh, 10,000 samples, a multiplication factor of 20 will create a data set with 200,000 samples. Temperature is a bit more, um, it's a bit more complicated to explain. You can see this uh, graph. Um, temperature is um, temperature controls how um, how much the output of the teacher, which the student should match, is adjusted. So the loss is a bit more expressive. As you can see here, you can have um, uh, output distri distribution which is quite sharp. Basically. Um, basically all the probability mass at one label and you and uh, this 
isn't really what you want because you want because the other models that are predicted by the teach uh, the other labels which are predicted by the teacher even if they are wrong they can still be useful for the student model to learn because they show a bit about how the teacher predicts um, their uh, their labels um, so by setting a higher temperature, you can smoothen this distribution. Of course, you shouldn't do this too much because after that, every label has the same probability and that also doesn't make too much sense. And yeah, another um, hyperparameter is distillation loss weight. This just controls how much importance is being given to this distillation and how much importance is uh, given to the normal labels from the da data set. For all of these hyperparameters, you can usually just leave them at their default value. That should work quite well already. However, for, for example, temperature can usually give you a slight performance boost if you tune this. There, there aren't really specific recommendations for that because this heavily depends on the teacher, but uh, doing a basic grid search, just trying out a few parameters can be somewhat useful. Um, yeah, if you are now interested in achieving similar results or just using our results, one step you can take is just trying out one of our distilled models, like I said. Tiny Roberta Squad 2 um, works um, nearly as well as Roberta, just trained on Squad 2, and it performs twice as fast. So you can just use it out of the box from the Hugging Face Model Hub. If you want, you can also distill your own model, either, either completely from scratch for or just for a specific task. For this, you can just take a look at the model distillation guide that we've published on. Uh, on, on the Haystack website. And if you're interested in how it works exactly, you can also read the tiny bird paper. Are there now any more questions or any questions at all? Yeah, thank you for the presentation, Michel. Uh, I'm sure there are some people uh, who are eager to try this out right now. <laughs> Maybe they already had some, some questions before trying it out. Um, <laughs> but great to see the simplicity um, of these only two lines of code. Uh, can you share the inference result you are trying to share on the website? I guess it should come out. Um, I'm not sure which. Oh, I think that's the old talk. Yeah, yeah I think this was related to me, but maybe I can uh, just uh, ask a short question. Um, uh, when I was using uh, Distilbird before, I uh, f found that sometimes it, um, uh, like it's a small performance gap, but uh, the gap was especially strong on the minority classes. Uh, have you seen something uh, similar in Tiny Birds? Um, no, but um, what what's what may be interesting is that actually because there isn't really a small model of this size, the model that we mentioned here, but with six layers, is actually uh, distilled bird. So we see that that using this approach created uh, uh, the performance uh, performance difference and i think what yeah i think when you used distillbird you probably just fine tuned distillbird and having this task specific step also helped a lot but uh, i think but and i think this should uh, behave similarly but we haven't really looked into that Thanks. I think there, there's also right what minority classes are for question answering. It's it's not that obvious, I guess, right? I mean, for classification, you could you could well check the class population, but for question answering, um, I don't know what that actually would be. Right? Answer of question, yeah, something like that. But we haven't checked that. Yeah, or questions yeah, from the test set that don't that don't have much overlap with the training data set, uh, things like that, right? With completely different vocabulary, maybe. Yeah? So there's another question in the chat, and the difference. Uh, the question is about what's the main difference between tiny bird and distilled bird. Um, well, um, distilled bird doesn't have this um, this task specific distillation step, and um, and in our experiments, that that was just a big difference in uh, in, in accuracy. 
task specific distillation takes additional time compared to just fine tuning but this was what what actually uh, created this um, very tiny performance difference when just using fine tuning a uh, tiny bird was very similar to distilled bird mm -hmm. And then there's uh, one more question about uh, languages. So the example that you showed was about um, English language only. One user asked, well, this can also work for other languages. Maybe you can explain what would be necessary to do it, um, let's say, on Arabic language. Yeah. And um, when, well, you, first of all, you would need um, Arabic um, teacher. So a model that already performs well on Arabic, probably something like this already exists. And then you have to do both steps. So you also have to do this uh, general distillation. You, for this, you would need a general a corpus of text in Arabic, for example. And after that, you can also just uh, use task specific distillation like we did. What's the fine tuning tasks of Tiny Bird? Yeah, I think you answered this yourself, QA, um, but you can use any other fine tuning tasks. The method is quite general. Yeah, so for example, for this <coughs> Arabic, for this Arabic model, if you already have a large Arabic text classification model, I don't know, maybe a sentiment classification model for Arabic texts, you could use the method that Michel presented to um, decrease the size of the model to make it smaller so that it is faster and then uses a lower amount of memory while still getting the same or almost the same output prediction quality. So the classification results will be as good as of the large teacher model. Yeah. Um, what, uh, yeah, I think this also shows um, the, the, the advantage of this two-stage two method because there are some methods which are just task specific like extreme distill and and when using this general distillation, you can, um, you, for example, for sentiments, sentiment classifier, you could also just use task specific distillation afterwards for QA or something else and wouldn't need to do uh, this general step again. Okay. Yeah, many people in the chat are thanking you for the presentation, which is very nice. Um, also, thanks for my side, of course. Yeah. So there are no more questions, but we actually have time. So I, I have one question for you, and that would be uh, if you had, let's say, uh, six more months to work on uh, model distillation or, let's say, model compression, uh, what would you uh, what would you do if this project would continue? What would you try out? What do you think are promising paths for future work? I think you can you can you can um, just um, combine a few approaches. For example, extreme distill just drain each layer uh, separately and got better for performance with that. So um, really matching for, for tiny bird, you also have to match student and teacher layers. But with extreme distill, you um, train just one student layer at a time. And you could, for example, try to combine this with this general and task specific uh, method. Um, <coughs> sorry, one, one person also asked in the chat if we tried quantization. And I think this is quite interesting because quantization is a completely different me method that you could use on top. For example, um, half precision methods could still be used with um, just a distilled model, this is a different step. So you could use quantization or any other optimization after distilling your model. Uh, can we use ONNX? Um, uh, you can uh, export a distilled model to ONNX and use the optimizations present there. I think that's all, it also has quantization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm, I think it haystack works on oh, oh, oh. <coughs> yeah haystack works on Windows yes yeah so the answer is actually yes yeah I mean most of the users don't try it with Windows but we know from some and, and for them it works yeah we see that also you can check um, our GitHub repository 
and uh, issues there or questions from the past. And there you can sometimes see that uh, Windows users have some challenges, additional challenges, but we can help them to, to solve these challenges. <coughs> right. And uh, um, it's not for German language only, right? Yeah. yeah. So this, uh, the language model we published works only on English, but um, the code obviously can be used for English and German for and any other language. All right, then for time reasons, thank you so much for the presentation, Michael. And uh, this concludes our first part of today, uh, the talks. So I will stop the recording now. And then what we can do afterwards, 